Well, hello again, and welcome to our devotions here, Christ Baptist Church, our daily devotions. And we happen to be in the book of Jonah here. We've done Jonah chapter 1, and now we're in Jonah chapter 2. And uh, I know this is a, a very fun story to read because it, it just involves uh, something that is just so miraculous. We just are, are just amazed every time we hear it. And uh, again, we, as we said yesterday, it's the world's greatest fish story. So instead of a man saying, I caught a fish this big, it's a fish saying, I caught a man this big. And, and so that's really kind of the, the picture that we have of Jonah. But that's not really what the story is about. Many think the story is about a man getting swallowed by a fish, but it's actually not. And we're learning here about something about God and something about us in this amazing little book of four chapters. And I just want to give us a recount of chapter 1 before we get into chapter 2, which is a shorter chapter. And one simple lesson coming out of, of Jonah chapter 2, which we're going to get, which adds up to this whole picture of what we're going to get to when we get to chapter 4. And I also want to tell you that there is a bit of a, not a surprise ending, but, but something that says, here's what God was actually doing in sending Jonah to Nineveh and the fish and all of that and what was actually happening in the background that was driving this whole thing. And uh, it's not in the book of Jonah, and you're going to see it, though, in terms of what is happening. But as we see Jonah, we covered in yesterday's devotion, Jonah is a prophet of God. He is Jonah the son of Amittai, and he is prophesying in the northern part of Israel, and he's much like, similar to, a prophet like Elijah that was prophesying up north to the wicked kingdoms of the north before they were, they were taken out. And, uh, and so he is prophesying there and largely under the, the reign of a king called Jeroboam. Now this is Jeroboam II, not Jeroboam I, who started the kingdom of Israel, but this is later on, Jeroboam II. And Jonah was there prophesying giving the word of the Lord to the north as God was still faithfully trying to encourage his people to follow him. So Jonah's a prophet. And what we see here is God gave Jonah a very simple message. Verse 2, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and crowd against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Nineveh is an enemy of Israel. They, in terms of, of just measuring humanity, they were really vicious. Uh, they, it was, they were a terror, they, they tortured people, they, they tormented Israel. So Jonah knew them as just wicked enemies of Israel. And God said, go cry against it, for their wickedness have come up before me. Now you think a prophet of God would actually have a little bit of enjoyment to go and explain to Nineveh that judgment is coming. You know, they, they, because he would think in his heart, they've got it coming. But it's interesting, Jonah in verse 3 went completely the opposite direction. Instead of going from Israel to what is now modern day Iraq, he took a boat and tried to get all the way to Spain. He tried to get around the Mediterranean, around the Rock of Gibraltar, and, and, and get out as far as possible. He ran away from God. And why was he running from God? That's our question. I think we began to answer it yesterday. He, he first ran and got into a boat. Verse 4. It shows us that God saw exactly what Jonah was doing. And, and he said, you're not going to get away. The Lord hurled a great wind on the sea. He, he threw a hurricane, threw a cyclone at the boat that Jonah was on. Which says, by the way, when you're running from God, as we saw yesterday, it'll affect a lot of people. The poor captain, the sailors, everybody was just turned upside down, all because of Jonah. But he didn't care. Jonah didn't care. He just wanted to make sure that he could get away from God as much as possible. So he tried to get away. God threw a storm at Jonah, which said, I'm going to now force the ship to come back. Jonah didn't want any part of it. And so verse, verse 5, 
when everybody's trying to figure out what to do, Jonah goes and lays down to fall asleep. So he tries to run from God in his dreams. He tries to run and say, now I'm just not even going to be awake. So what happened there in verse 6, God sent the captain. The captain approached Jonah and said, how can you be sleeping? How is this possible? And so he said, come, let's every man cast lots on this. So Jonah was thinking he could just get kind of mixed in with the sailors then. God said, no, we're going to cast lots and it's going to point to you. God made everything point to Jonah, say, this is you on the spot. I have a message that you need to give as a prophet and you're going to give it. Jonah said in verse 9, I am a Hebrew, I fear the Lord God of heaven who made the sea of the dry land. We see right there that he, he, he gives a conflicting message. I fear God, but I'm running from Him. How is that possible? And this is a point of application we got yesterday, which is when you're in the middle of hypocrisy, everybody sees it. Everybody sees it. When you say, I fear the Lord, but your actions show that you're running from Him, it's interesting how the pagan people can actually see that. And you're exposed to the pagans. He said, what are you doing? You're not, you're not fearing God. You're running from Him. So Jonah desired so much to be away from God, he said, throw me into the sea, which he did. Now, I, I told you in chapter 4 is really the answer why Jonah was running from God, and even to the point where he said, I'd rather die than have God's will be accomplished because Nineveh ended up repenting of Jonah's message and chapter 4 verse 1 says it greatly displeased Jonah and he became angry and, and, and he said in verse 2 of chapter 4 please Lord was not this what I said while I was in my own country therefore in order to forestall this in order to stop you I fled to Tarshish because I knew that you're gracious and compassionate slow to anger, abundant loving kindness, and one who relents in calamity. I knew that this would probably happen. See, Jonah did not want the Ninevites to be saved. He did not want the Ninevites to repent. He did not want the Ninevites to have God's blessing. His heart was that hard. And that caused him to not really want to deliver God's message. Oh, he understood God's message. He just did not want not only did he not want to deliver it himself, he did not want the message to be delivered. He wanted to actually fight God to keep the message from going to the people God wanted to communicate to. That's what hardness of heart does because he was so angry that God might actually save the Ninevites. He did not believe in forgiveness. Jonah did not want to forgive. He did not love. He did not have God's heart. And so what we see there is Jonah did not see himself as a man who needed much forgiveness. And that showed on how he felt about everybody else. And that brings us then to chapter 2, where Jonah's now in the belly of the fish. And there's a simple point here. A simple point that we're going to get to. I want to read these verses. But before I do, I want to show you one more thing. In Jonah chapter 1, Notice how Jonah was running from the presence of the Lord, verse 3. And he mentions that several times throughout chapter 1. Away from the presence of the Lord. Away from the presence of the Lord. But verse 3, he's running away. So what did, what did God do in, chapter, in verse 4? He hurled a wind on the sea. And there was a great storm. And so as they're, they're fooling around on the ship, trying to figure out what to do, we see that the waves are becoming even stronger. Verse 11, the sailors are saying, what do we do that the sea may become calm for us? But the sea was becoming increasingly stormy. And said, verse 13, however, the men rowed desperately to return to land, but they could not, for the sea was becoming even stormier against them. You see, God just ratcheted up the intensity Every time Jonah tried to make a move, God would just ratchet up the pressure and the pain and everybody felt it, including Jonah. To the point where when they threw him overboard, Jonah thought he won. You compare like verse 3 with, or verse 4 with uh, verse 17. He hurled a great storm in verse 4. Verse 17, the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the stomach of the fish three days and three nights. 
God controls the weather, God controls the fish. He tells the fish where to go. And they just obey him, they don't even think about it. They don't fight, they don't have any moral fiber in them to fight one way or the other. They do exactly what their creator says. So the great fish came and swallowed Jonah three days and three nights. Now why did the fish do that? Well, common sense tells us he did it to keep Jonah alive because God's intention was for Jonah to deliver the message. Did you think about that for a moment? The issue isn't that the message needs to be delivered. God can deliver a message by the mouth of a donkey, we found in, 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 in the book of Numbers. God can accomplish a message coming any way. But God wanted Jonah to deliver this message. That was actually the point. Not that the message needed to go and God needed to find somebody. God needed Jonah to see that he needed to deliver this message. And that was the issue. So God puts him now in the belly of a fish and says, now I've got you, you're not going anywhere. But the issue is not that you're running from me. The issue is why you're running from me. And we've got to talk about that, Jonah. And so he prays. Now, as we read this prayer, let's just read it here first. And I'll give you some observations to make the actual point of chapter 2. Here it is. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the stomach of the fish. There it is. He, he, was, he was swallowed in chapter 1, verse 17. Chapter 2, verse 1. Now he prays to God in the belly of the fish. It's pretty dark in there, I would imagine. And he said, I called out of my distress to the Lord, and he answered me. I cried for help from the depth of Sheol. You heard my voice. No doubt Jonah thinks, he, he thinks he's dying. So I cry out while I'm still alive, while I've got breath, to do that. Verse 3, for you had cast me into the deep. Notice he blames God for that. But as we read chapter 1, he said to the sailors, he said, you need to throw me into the sea. So it wasn't God who did this. He said, you know, they, were, they were actually not wanting to throw him into the sea. He said, we pray, don't let us perish on account of this man's life, but it isn't blood on us. Jonah said in verse 12, pick me up and throw me into the sea. That's Jonah's command to the men. What does he pray? Verse 3, for you would cast me into the deep. Boy, this sounds like Adam, doesn't it? You know, the woman you gave me. He still didn't get it. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the current engulfed me. All your breakers and billows passed over me. All of this now, his situation. He's been running from God. He has tried to book a boat as far away as possible. Tried to go to sleep. Tried to ignore God in every way. And then even tried to commit suicide. When God traps him and says, Now you're going to st be stuck in that deep, dark place in the belly of a fish. Sometimes it's a place where some of us have felt before where everything has been taken away and we're stuck. And we feel like we're in the belly of the deep dark fish. We need to learn Jonah's lesson here. And this is it. Jonah, start, he hadn't learned it yet because he's trying to pray to God and yet he's blaming God in the midst of his prayer. You threw me into the deep. Your current engulfed me. Your billows passed over me. What? This is not God's doing, this is your doing. You have not learned a lesson yet. See, we run a mistake, but we think just because Job is praying, God is listening, and he's really praying hard, and it's great, and he's, he's going to have mercy because Job is really depending on God. He's blaming God here. Verse 4, So I said I've been expelled from your sight. Nevertheless, I will look again toward your holy temple. Look at me. Yes, all these things are happening to me, but hey, I still care about God and His temple. I still, I still look forward to when I can actually worship you like I always have. Water encompassed me to the point of death. The great deep engulfed me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. Those things are naturally true. I bet the fish had a lot of weeds in his stomach. 
I descended to the roots of the mountains. The earth with its bars was around me forever. But you have brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. So he's praying, saying, I know you're going to deliver me because I'm still alive here. Three days and three nights. Can you imagine what, what it would have felt like maybe at the end of the night of the first day or halfway through the second day? Jonah's saying, it's still, you know, I'm still here in the belly of this fish. Man, he had to wonder how long is he going to stay there being alive in the belly of a fish. Verse 7, while I was fainting away, I remembered the Lord. My prayer came to you into your holy temples. He's trying to show how devout he is. and My prayer came to you and I'm doing this. He just got done blaming God. So now he immediately starts talking about the Ninevites. Those who regard vain idols forsake their faithfulness. But I will sacrifice to you. Do you see that? Jonah's now comparing himself to the Ninevites, whom God said, I want you to go preach to them and I'll destroy them. But he's saying, ah, but remember them, God. They are really bad pagan people who worship idols. But I will sacrifice to you. I'll do that because I know better. So far we haven't heard from God, have we? We just let Jonah kind of blather on and on and on about blaming God and talking about how righteous he is. That which I have vowed, I will pay. He says all of this with the voice of thanksgiving. I'll sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will gladly give to you, O Lord. Lord's quiet. He just keeps going until he says the one thing he needs to learn. The very last phrase in verse 9. Salvation is from the Lord. He could never say it until then. You see, he always believed salvation is from being a Jew. Salvation is being one of God's chosen people. Salvation is obeying the Lord properly. Salvation is saying, but I will sacrifice to you. Salvation is having the voice of thanksgiving when you sacrifice. Salvation is remembering the Lord. Salvation is praying to you and thinking of his holy temple. That's salvation to Jonah until he finally comes to realize something. No, 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 no. Salvation is of the Lord, which means it is your choice, God. It has nothing to do with my works, my righteousness, and all that I'm doing. You know what? I've got no say in whether Nineveh gets saved or not. Salvation is of the Lord. And that's even true for me. So whether I sacrifice or not, Salvation is in your hands, God, not mine. And once he says that, look at verse 10. Then the Lord commanded the fish and it vomited Jonah up onto the dry land. The ride was over. The fish was ready to go and took Jonah to spit him out onto dry land. Now that's a, that's a healthy spit, I think to go from a big fish who had to live in deep water to actually put Jonah out on dry land. Not, it, didn't, it didn't say on the land, it says on the dry land. There's a specific Hebrew word for dry land. Now, that's a supernatural event, for sure. Why did God do it? Because Jonah at least demonstrated verbally he learned his lesson. What's his lesson? Salvation is the Lord. What's his lesson? Jonah, salvation's not up to you. What's his lesson? Jonah, your own righteousness is worth nothing and you shouldn't be comparing it to others. Your self-righteousness is keeping you from being my servant. This is why God wanted Jonah to deliver the message. Not why he wanted his message delivered. He could get anybody to deliver his message. He wanted Jonah to do it. Why? Jonah had a lesson to learn. He was filled with pride and self-righteousness. He's better than the Ninevites. 
God will surely judge the Ninevites. They're not like us. And I don't want God to give them any chance. And once verse 1 and verse 2 of chapter 1 came in, Jonah thought, oh, they've got a chance. Let me run away. God said, I will chase you and hound you. He wasn't chasing Jonah because he needed his message delivered. He was chasing Jonah because Jonah needed to see his own sin. And that's why he put him in the belly of the fish. Because he would rather die than face his own sin. But until he realized here, salvation is of the Lord, God said, we're going to stay right where we are. But as soon as he said that, as soon as he said, I now understand, you really are the one who determines men's futures. You're the ones who determines who gets grace and mercy and who does not. I have no say in it. I have no reason or justification to ever say that again. The Lord says, good, now it's time to get on dry land. Let's get on with it. Do you notice here, Jonah is praying desperately out of his despair. But God doesn't answer him until Jonah addresses his own sin. And he finally has his own problem exposed to where now God is telling Jonah, your problem of being in the fish is not near as big as your problem of being self-righteous and a racist and I need to get that fixed. And you need to see it. Jonah's internal problem was much bigger than his external problem being inside the belly of a fish. So, we see God desiring to pursue the Ninevites, but he wanted Jonah to do it. Jonah ran away. God said, I'm not letting you get away because I'm after you, Jonah. I'm not after the Ninevites. That's going to happen. And you're going to be the one to do it because I really need you to see something about yourself in this whole thing. So he did. In chapters 1 and chapters 2. So he spit out on the dry land. And then we get to chapter 3 tomorrow where we're going to see exactly what Jonah's message was and what God did in it. But there's some other interesting scientific facts that are going to come out as well about what it's like to have been in the belly of a fish and, and what happens there and then to chapter 4 where we understand what God's purpose was and ultimately why he decided to just go after Nineveh in the first place. But right now we see him using Nineveh as saying I'm going to use it as a way to help adjust the, the wicked heart of my prophet who has let his heart grow hard with hatred toward his fellow man. So that's what we see in Jonah chapter 2. So Jonah's 1 and 2, pretty interesting book about the fish that caught a man this big. Thank you for being with us. We'll catch chapter 3 tomorrow.